Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Ramsey County Second Judicial, Judicial District Court 3 and 29 candidate forms. My name is Deb Brinkman. I will be your moderator this evening. This evening's forum is organized by the League of Women Voters of St. Paul in partnership with the Minnesota and Ramsey County Bar Association and the St. <clears throat> and the St. Paul Neighborhood Network, SPNN. hear from candidates on key issues that touch their lives so they could make informed decisions at the polls. The League is a nonpartisan organization that does not support or oppose any specific political party or candidate. The views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates, not those of the League of Women Voters or of SPNN. Following the forums, the League of Women Voters, Minnesota, and our local league chapters will post the complete unedited recordings to YouTube and the league's website, lwvsp.org. Editing is authorized only for official media reporting. Excerpts or edited clips of candidate forms may not be used for partisan or other political purposes. We believe the success of our city, county, and state depends on these values, knowledge and commitment of our elected officials. Thus, it's essential for the public to better understand the views, opinions, and commitments of candidates running for elected office. This understanding better equips voters to make informed decisions according to their values and interests. We appreciate candidates and the audience for taking time to be with us tonight. You may have all noticed that there are cards on your chairs. These cards are for writing down questions for the candidates to answer. Once you have a question, please hold it up and one of our volunteers will pick it up from you. Without further ado, let's introduce the candidates for Ramsey County 2nd Judicial District. Running to represent Court 3 is Tim Carey. Challenger Paul Yang was invited and we reached out to him multiple times, but we received no response from him. Running to represent Court 2 is Timothy Mulroney. Um, Challenger Winona Yang was also invited, but she had a scheduling conflict. The candidates participating in tonight's forum have all agreed to the forum rules, which are as follows. First, campaign materials, including buttons, signs, literature, and clothing are not allowed in the studio, but you can find candidate materials, if there are any, on the tables in the lobby. Each candidate will give a two-minute introductory statement. Candidates will have one minute to answer questions and 30 seconds for a rebuttal if necessary. Maximum three per candidate. A timer will signal them when they have 15 seconds remaining and when their time is up. We will accept written questions throughout the forum. Questions submitted by the audience must be applicable to all candidates. Nonpartisan in nature, and they must be on topics relative to the office. Again, if you have a question, please write it on your card and hold it up so one of our volunteers will come get it. Questions that are of a personal nature, that are embarrassing, hostile, or unclear in intent will not be asked. Similar questions may be consolidated or edited for clarity and brevity. Please remain as quiet as possible so that everyone can hear. Please hold your applause until the forum has ended so that candidates will have as much time as possible to answer your questions. Please silence your cell phones. Members of the media may be recording this forum for their own use. The forum is also being recorded by St. Paul Neighborhood Network viewing for viewing by the public. We ask that members of the public not make their own recordings or take photos of the form in progress. With that, we'll start with the opening statements. Each candidate will have two minutes for an opening statement, and we will start with Tim Carey. 
Good evening, my name is Tim Carey and I'm a judge in the second district. I'm really happy to be here and grateful for this time. I'm excited to see the people turn out to find out who we are. These races for uh, the judgeships are extremely important and they probably have a lot of impact on your life in ways that you may or may not appreciate if you're not in court all the time. Uh, I was appointed in 2022 by Governor Walz and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan uh, at the conclusion of the uh, rigorous uh, judicial selection process, which is a merit-based uh, process in which uh, a very highly uh, skilled group of lawyers compete for a single seat. Uh, the governor appointed me because of my uh, long history of commitment to public service. I have lived in Ramsey County for almost all of the last 30 years, and during almost all of that time, I've served uh, the public as uh, starting as a parole officer in Ramsey County, where I assessed uh, people who were convicted of sex crimes and made recommendations to the sentencing judge with the interest, the primary interest of public safety uh, and rehabilitation of the person if they weren't bound for prison. I testified at sentencing hearings and probation violation proceedings and civil commitment proceedings. I did this work from 1999 until 2010. Uh, the lawyers that I encountered in the courtroom uh, processes inspired me to return to law school um, or to go to law school after graduate, 12 years after graduating college. Um, after I completed law school, the primary bulk of my uh, lawyer experience was at the Ramsey County Attorney's Office as an assistant Ramsey County attorney. During that time, I worked primarily in the Civil Commitments Division. Uh, my job there was to seek court orders for treatment for people with serious and persistent mental illness and substance use disorders. I also focused a great deal on people with mental illness issues uh, who became embroiled in the criminal justice system. I believe that I'm the better candidate uh, to retain this seat and I hope I get your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. And Timothy Mulrooney, please. My name is Timothy Mulrooney. I am a Ramsey County judge. I'm uh, running for re-election this year and I'm hoping to convince voters to vote for me. I uh, think about why I wanna be a judge or continue to be a judge. And the reason is because I want to serve. And uh, at the heart of that is figuring out what your talent is and wanting to contribute it to serve others. And I think my talent is being a pretty good judge. And when you think about what you want on the bench, you want judges who treat people with respect and um, maintain their dignity in the courtroom. You want judges who make decisions based on the law applied to the facts that are in front of them. And you want judges who engage in the system to try to make the system better for the people we serve. And I think I do that. And I've learned how to do that over many years of practice as a lawyer, many years of practice as a judicial officer. I have been a lawyer for 30 years. I began my career as a law clerk to a judge in Hennepin County 30 years ago. I then prosecuted criminal cases for five years, trying and negotiating cases in front of juries and judges and with the, uh, opposing counsel in Hennepin County. I then got a job at a law firm in Minneapolis, Henson and Efron, and I began to practice civil litigation and family law, primarily family law. And I represented clients who had cases appearing before family courts across the metro area for the next eight years, representing people who are going through probably the most difficult times in their lives and appearing with them in courtrooms, advocating for them, uh, being with them as they were navigating a really frightening and challenging uh, system. In 2008, I became a referee in Hennepin County Family Court, and then in 2016, Governor Dayton appointed me to the Ramsey County bench where I have served in all of our divisions since that time. And so I believe I have significant experience as a judge. I'm tested, you know what you're getting, and I hope you'll vote for me, thank you. Thank you, Timothy. And Timothy, we'll start with you with this first question. Um, we talked. A, you've talked a little bit about what has motivated you um, to pursue your career, but is there anything in particular that distinguishes you as a candidate? 
Well, the number one thing that distinguishes me in my particular race is experience. I have many, many years of experience as a lawyer. I have 16 years being on a bench um, adjudicating cases. Eight of those have been the last eight years as a judge. I'm the only one, certainly in my race, that has any of that experience. I, um, I have tried cases, I have represented clients in court, I have presided over cases in civil and criminal, mental health court, juvenile court, child protection. Um, I currently work along with Judge Gary in our treatment courts where we preside over cases where people are um, working through our treatment programs to maintain stability, stay out of jail, and be safe for the community. So I think what distinguishes me in my race is a depth of experience, and again, I think I'm, I'm a proven commodity for the community. Thank you, Timothy. And Tim Carey, please. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I think that what distinguishes me from uh, as a candidate is my experience in uh, treatment for mental health uh, and substance use disorders as they reflect as they uh, show up in the legal system. I currently preside over Veterans Treatment Court and Mental Health Court and a special calendar um, dedicated to people who are not competent to proceed in criminal processes because of their mental illness or substance use disorders disorder. Um, before I had the opportunity to preside over treatment courts, uh, I was immediately on swear my swearing in um, thrown into felony level and misdemeanor, gross misdemeanor and felony level trials on anything from misdemeanor um, disorderly conducts to felony level sexual assaults and murder. Um, so I have a, a firm understanding of the role and the preponderance of mental illness and substance use issues um, that become involved in the criminal justice system and how to respond to them. Thank you very much. And Tim, we'll start with you with this next question. How would you describe your judicial philosophy and how does it guide your decision making? Uh, my, the first prong of my judicial philosophy is a dedication to the letter of the law. So when I'm preparing for court, um, the first thing I do is review the pleadings uh, to understand what the legal issues are that will be coming before me. And after that, um, I review the law uh, to make sure that my personal feelings, my personal beliefs, my, my thoughts about how the world should work are not what's driving uh, my decision making process. Instead. Uh, I am wedded to the law. Um, that's the very first thing I did as a judge was swear an oath um, to uphold the Constitution of Minnesota and the United States and the laws of this land. So that's um, the very first thing that I do and my first consideration and my final consideration when I issue an order. Uh, in between there, I want every person who comes before me to know that I take their case seriously, um, that they're seen, that they're heard, and um, that I understand that this is probably the most important thing in their life at this time. Thank you very much. Timothy Mulrooney, please. You know, I think I'd say my judicial philosophy focuses on um, the two central elements of court proceedings, process and the outcome. And philosophically, I think it is critically important that people be treated fairly in our courtrooms during their hearings, that they have an opportunity to have their case heard, to put their case forward, that they are treated with respect and can maintain their dignity throughout the process. It's, uh, that is not that easy to accomplish and that is something that's critically important to have a fair process in a justice system. And then the other half of that is uh, a just outcome. And a just outcome, as Judge Kerry said, is um, uh, fidelity to the law and applying the law to the facts in the particular case, regardless of my own personal feelings and sentiments. And I strive to do that. I strive to issue orders that are clear, that are brief, um, that are easily understood so that people feel like they were treated properly. Thank you very much. And Timothy, we'll start with you with this next question. Um, what atmosphere do you want to foster in your courtroom? Well, I probably touched on that, but the, I want a courtroom where people um, are not afraid. I want a courtroom where people feel like they will be heard. I want a courtroom where they are heard. I want a courtroom where uh, people are treated with respect so that they can put their case forward without fear. Um, and they have the opportunity to vindicate their procedural due process rights, which means to put their case forward um, without um, without shame, without obstruction, and um, 
that is the atmosphere I want to create in my courtroom. Thank you. Tim Carey, please. I recognize that when people are coming to court, uh, they're meeting up with people like me who's uh, almost all of their career uh, unfolded in a courtroom. Uh, and they're people who have probably never been to a courtroom or have rarely been to a courtroom or have only been to a courtroom uh, when very stressful things are happening in their life um, and they need a neutral person um, to hear the arguments and make a decision. I want to ensure, even even the building can be imposing, it's large marble, uh, <laughs> heavily wooded building uh, on the inside and some of our rooms are themselves very intimidating. I want the people to feel comfortable that this is their court, that this is their opportunity to be heard. Uh, I want to make sure that um, no issues related to gender, gender expression, uh, socioeconomic status, or race uh, cause anyone to feel that they're not going to get a fair shake in the courtroom. Thank you. And we'll start with you, Tim, on this next question. How do you balance impartiality with the impact of your decisions on individuals and communities? This is probably the hardest part of the job. Um, the I, the balance um, is is in favor of the law every time. Um, it is sometimes a very um, harsh and difficult position to be in, uh, to pull the lever, to um, make the final decision, for example, that someone is going to prison or that someone is going to lose their housing. Um, the, uh, the reality is that um, in those circumstances, uh, the only comfort is in, in providing um, fair process uh, to ensure that people understand um, that I'm not acting out of uh, bias, um, that I, I've given each side its due, and I've taken the, um, the circumstances and the facts of the case extremely seriously. Um, my only balance has to be in favor of the law. Thank you. Timothy Mulrooney, please. Uh, if, if the question is how do I maintain my own impartiality, it's certainly to be not influenced by anything that happens outside of the courtroom or any information that's flowing outside the courtroom ruled solely on the information I receive in the courtroom. I uh, think it is critically important for judges to be conscious of the fact that implicit bias is something that we all experience and we have to be mindful of that. We have to pause when we're making decisions to consider how we might be influenced by things that are in our subconscious and I strive to do that. Um, if the question is how do I balance uh, the impact where an impact on an outcome uh, is a conflict between the individual and the community, that is a very challenging thing to do and a lot of what we do as judges is making decisions right around that balance between, for example, in criminal court, public safety and civil liberty. Um, and I, I guess all I can say is I think that that takes the, the kind of judgment that comes from experience to make those decisions. Thank you. And we'll start with you. Uh, Timothy, on this next question, how would you balance a complainant's privacy in privacy interests with a defendant's rights in criminal trials? And Timothy, we'll start with you on this one. Well, I would follow the law. So there are substantial rules around those kinds of issues in criminal cases. Um, a defendant has a fundamental right to due process in a criminal case. That includes access to evidence that might be exculpatory. Uh, a, a, uh, individuals, including victims, have privacy rights that sometimes butt up against those due process rights. That we do have tools that we can use to try to protect that. We can uh, conduct in-camera reviews, which we do in chambers outside the hearing of the public to review the evidence, to determine if it's relevant and discoverable in a criminal case. Uh, we can issue protective orders if appropriate to uh, manage the use of the information to uh, try to protect privacy interests. But at the end of the day, um, a person whose liberty is at stake in a criminal case is um, paramount and they, if they have a due process right to have access to information, then I would vindicate that. Thank you. Tim Carey, please. Can you repeat the question? Absolutely. How do you balance a complainant's privacy interests with a defendant's rights in criminal trials? 
Uh, the what I would add to Judge Mulroney's answer, um, because there there is a fair amount of law that governs. Um, access to this type of information. I would add that the public, uh, excuse me, the courtroom in a proceeding um, that you're describing is a public forum. So um, a fair amount of information is going to come out in that forum uh, and it is um, going to be based on the strategy of the attorneys uh, bringing out that information or seeking to bring out that information. Um, it is otherwise um, subject to a specific case law um, and uh, victims' rights rules. Thank you, Tim. And we'll start with you with this next question. What do you see as the biggest challenges for judicial administration in Ramsey County, and how would you address them? To me, some of the biggest issues uh, for administration of justice in Ramsey are the um, enormous uh, dockets for course, court cases. Uh, it's difficult to uh, give people um, the focus that they deserve and the full complement of time that their cases and their controversies deserve uh, when we have such enormous um, caseloads. Uh, however, um, I, I do think we have some control over that. We, we've, um, relative to the mental health issues and substance use issues, um, we have created some of our own dockets to off ramp people um, who have those issues and are in the criminal justice system when they get to a certain level of impairment so that we can uh, return to their cases regularly and determine how they're doing and see what we need to do to help support them. Thank you, Tim. And Timothy Mulrooney, please. Fundamental to a fair system of justice is access to justice. And I think we need to be conscientious about uh, issues around, for example, and access to interpreters. We have in our county, I think, the most significant number of cases that require interpreters and a shortage of interpreter services in the state. That's a significant challenge for us. Um, it is uh, always an issue about whether or not we were, are um, providing um, the maximum amount of fairness in our proceedings, and that includes um, inclusion of all communities in our juries. So I think we have to continue to be conscientious and vigilant about uh, making sure that the jurors that we have coming into our courtrooms reflect the community. Um, and then I don't know, I only have 15 seconds, but I would say mental health is a substantial challenge for the administration of justice in our county. Thank you. And then we'll start with you, Timothy, on this next question. If elected, what responsibilities do you believe you have to the community? My responsibility as a judge is to, I think, is to do fundamentally two things. Number one, to uh, provide fair process and outcome in the specific cases that come before me. Fairness is the process that we provide in the courtroom. Fairness is opportunity to present your case and be heard. Fairness is an outcome that is based on the facts in your case and a correct application of the law to the facts in your case. Um, I think I have that, that is a fundamental obligation I have to the community and the administration of my job. The other thing that I think is a fundamental responsibility of all judges is to be part of trying to make our system better. And I do try to do that. I have been involved in a number of committees over the years where we've looked at our systems and tried to make them better. Judges have really a unique vantage point in knowing how our systems work. I am the co-chair of our mental health work group, which looks at all of the integration of the mental and the criminal systems to try to serve people better. And I think that that is essential for judges to do that. Thank you. Thank you. And Tim Carey, please. I, I believe that my responsibility to the community includes uh, being embedded in the community and understanding um, what the specific issues are in the second district. Uh, I work specifically, um, I draw on my experience as a probation and parole officer where I um, did home visits, where I attended treatment staffings with people um, who were on uh, parole for serious offenses. Um, I draw on my experience as a lawyer at the 
the county attorney's office meeting with victims of crimes and understanding uh, the far-reaching implications of uh, criminal behavior. Uh, and I draw on my last two and a half years as a judge uh, where I've shifted away from advocacy um, to sitting in a neutral seat um, and um, having people, um, the, the attorneys on each side, sprint at me with their advocacy skills. Um, so I, I uh, join in Judge Mulrooney's um, concern about mental health uh, and uh, continue, will continue to work in service to the community in that arena too. Thank you, Tim. And we'll start with you with this next question. What is the second judicial district court currently doing to promote equal access to justice and what more should it be doing? Uh, we are currently, uh, like many of the district courts around the state, um, working to uh, figure out how to use uh, remote appearances in the post-pandemic world. Um, that has been uh, an extraordinary tool um, in, in the administration of of justice in the second. Uh, I can tell you that when I was on the traditional criminal rotation, we had people, I had people appearing to enter pleas um, from literal broom closets at their work. And that always felt great because I knew that that person had a job that meant something to them and coming to court also meant something to them. And that job uh, was not the type of job that was paying them huge money. And um, so they were dedicated to doing that. And I've had people appear also uh, with children on their lap um, from their apartments because they didn't have any opportunity uh, to pay for childcare or to have someone else come in and bail them out so they could come to court. Um, so that's what the second's doing. Thank you, Tim. And Timothy Mulrooney, please. We have, you know, in, in Ramsey County, we have a, an incredibly um, engaged and uh, conscientious bench of 29 judges all who want to see us do better around equal access to justice. We have an, um, I would submit the greatest court administration in the state um, doing exactly the same kind of work and we have lots of work groups working on just exactly these kinds of issues. I would just highlight two things because I'm sure the little sign's gonna go up and tell me I don't have time to go on and on, but I will say two things. One, again, I'll touch on the jury thing. So we've uh, been doing outreach in um, the community to try to get um, input on the issue of representation on juries and, um, and our building solutions to that. And there's the sign again, but the other I will say is mental health. We do, we are, um, do, extensive work trying to figure out ways to better serve people who in, um, find themselves engaged in the justice system due to mental illness. Thank you. And Timothy, we'll start with you with, a, with this next question. And the question is, how is the court working to restore trust in the justice system, particularly among marginalized communities? Well, so I'm gonna use that to, I think that I'll continue with my previous answer, which I think builds on that and also is responsive to your question. So, you know, to, to build trust in the community, we need to do more than just decide our cases. We need to be part of trying to improve our system, whether it's access to justice um, or it's um, the disposition of our cases. And uh, the work we do, that I do, and frankly, so does Judge Carey as co-chairs of the mental health work group, um, does ex the, exactly the kind of work I think the community wants us to do. Finding the gaps in the system. Where are people falling through those gaps? And in the mental health arena, they fall through that gap a lot uh, between the criminal system and the mental health support system. And we are working tirelessly to try to fill those gaps and give people care. And I think that that is the kind of work a judge should be engaged in to build trust. Um, I, I, uh, the other thing I would quickly say in my last few seconds is I think that the public has concerns about courts becoming too political. I don't think they have that fear about our court in Ramsey County. Um, and I don't think that there's a basis for them to feel that way. Our court is very focused and very committed on being nonpartisan. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy. Tim Carey, please. One of the biggest issues related to public trust that I hear about uh, is the um, issue of 
proper levels of treatment uh, along the entire continuum of psychological care and support from case management services with medications to outpatient treatment with board and lodging to hospital level of care um, in local and state hospitals. Um, one other component within that is the, the very serious need for culturally competent treatment. So if I experienced the symptoms of schizophrenia and um, needed the court's intervention to access care, uh, my needs would be different from a person um, who immigrated from Thailand or who was a, a member of another culture uh, and what would work for me uh, may not work for that person. So I have, I truly believe that it's part of my job and my duty to continue to work to expand the access to care along the continuum of care uh, with specific uh, notice of the need for culturally competent treatment. Thank you, Tim. And we'll start with you with this next question. Do you support making access to information on pending criminal cases more equitable for private attorneys? Absolutely. You, I assume this question means private attorneys representing a criminal defendant. Correct. Yes, absolutely. Um, this system works well um, because uh, we have a really dedicated and talented pool of uh, prosecutors and public defenders, uh, but it should work just as well for people who are hiring private defense. Um, there should uh, there should not be any glitches in the system for uh, people who have private attorneys and who need access to um, information necessary to wage a vigorous defense on behalf of their client. Thank you, Tim. Timothy Mulrooney, please. Um, the question I heard is, do I support access to information on pending criminal cases to be more equitable to private attorneys? And uh, I'm not sure I entirely understand that question, but to the extent that it means should private attorneys representing people have the same access to information that public attorneys have representing people, and then yes, I absolutely think it should be the same for both. All right, thank you. And Timothy, we'll start with you with this next question. Um, we've talked a little bit about uh, the, how we're using remote hearings, um, but if you could maybe expand a little bit more on, on that. Uh, Timothy, this question is for you. How do you feel about continuing and expanding the use of remote hearings to enhance court accessibility? And do we have any gaps in making that remote accessibility happen? Uh, I think access to, rem to remote hearings is critical to build access to justice in our system. Um, so I think it's important that we take advantage of the availability of that technology. Um, and we do do that in our county as well as across the state. Um, it, it, for, you know, a good example is juvenile or child protection cases, families that are often single working parents, if they have a hearing they need to get to and they're also trying to maintain employment, they can appear at a hearing remotely and that improves their chances at access. Um, I also do still very much value in-person hearings, particularly for evidentiary hearings and trials. I think that is uh, critical to the uh, vindication of people's due process rights. Thank you very much. And Tim Carey, please. I do think that um, we've worked very hard to understand the role that remote appearances should play in the second. And I've, uh, I was happy to be part of a pilot project to extend remote appearances in the criminal court after the, um, the main thrust of the remote appearances for the pandemic ended. Um, one uh, other great use of it is when people are in treatment, um, they are able to just appear from treatment. It doesn't interrupt the entire day. Uh, treatment is, they're usually in, in residential treatment for really important reasons and really extreme uh, treatment needs. Uh, and I remember from my very first job in probation as a worker in the shelter in Anoka County, when kids had court um, that day, they didn't focus on treatment. They focused on going to see the judge. So if we can make that a really quick hit, um, um, or they come in and go out, that's great. Uh, and another, but uh, the other concern would be giving them enough opportunity to consult with their lawyers so that they're making well-informed decisions uh, with full access to information they need to make those decisions. Thank you, Tim. And we'll start with you with this next question. 
What are your views on judicial accountability and how do you ensure transparency in your courtroom? I think um, our, our jobs as judges are among the most important jobs in the community. Um, I don't say that from a, a boost of ego. I say that because I see people bringing their most serious concerns to me, uh, to the court, uh, to this process every day, all day, dozens if not uh, s several dozen cases per day. So I take that very seriously and I want the community to have every bit of appropriate um, information for them to see and hear and experience uh, to trust that we are dedicated to uh, doing the right thing on um, a case-by-case -case basis that serves the community. Um, I do think that um, we are an open courtroom. Uh, we are um, not conducting um, backroom deals in chambers. Uh, whatever we discuss in chambers um, we that can be done without um, harming victims or other populations um, we discuss on the record as well. Thank you, Tim. Timothy Mulrooney, please. Uh, yeah, we are, we are judges are accountable to the public and to the appellate courts and the work we do is transparent. We perform our function in courtrooms on the record. Everything we say is taken down by court reporters and the transcripts can be obtained to see what we said in the courtroom, how we talk to litigants, how we behave in front of. Uh, the public decisions we make orally on the record are, are exactly that, they're on the record and can be reviewed, so it's very transparent. Decisions we make in writing are exactly that, they're made in writing, they're placed in the court file, which is typically public and accessible to anybody to see how we do the work. Um, and then we are accountable. The decisions we make are absolutely accountable, first on appeal, if people feel that we are making poor judgments or misapplying the law, it's up for review in the appellate courts. Um, and of course, we're accountable through this process through um, judicial elections. Thank you very much. And we'll start with you with this next question. How do you stay informed about legal precedents and how does this influence your decisions? I read a lot. So, um, you know, the legal precedent is the decisions, there's a reference to the decisions that come out of our appellate courts, um, and I suppose broadly it might be a reference to new legislation and laws that get passed by the legislature. It's um, a fundamental responsibility of the judge to stay current on what the law is, particularly when a case is before you and to be familiar with it before you render a decision. Um, I read the cases as they come out from the appellate courts. Um, I read the cases that are cited to me and the law that is cited to me, and legal arguments that are provided by lawyers, um, and I apply the current and applicable law in the decisions that I make. Thank you. Tim Carey, please. Thank you. I also read a lot, um, and, uh, and happily, the lawyers that appear in the second um, are very talented um, on both sides, uh, and I do trust that most of the filings that I get and the briefs that I get um, reference the pertinent area of law. Um, we do have access, um, in case that isn't true, uh, we have access to the whole world of uh, case law as it relates to the issues before the court. Uh, so I definitely do my homework, uh, and we also have a very supportive state court administration um, who uh, allows us to form um, statewide judicial groups, and um, some of us uh, track uh, new cases that come down that might bear on our work from the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court uh, and help us uh, stay abreast of anything that may be coming our way that hasn't uh, come into our briefing docket yet. Thank you, Tim. And we'll start with you with this next question. So we've talked a little bit about um, the enormous caseloads. You've talked a little bit about some of the improvements, but let's just kind of focus on what strategies would you implement to reduce case backlogs and improve court efficiency? Well, I, I guess starting on time, using every moment that we have on the record, um, I know that um, we definitely especially when I was in the traditional criminal rotation, um, I was on the record 
almost all day, almost every day. Um, so I, I believe that um, our strategy for reduce, and that was an effort to reduce the criminal backlog from the pandemic. Um, we did do that. Um, I think when I came in, there were 900 backlog cases, and we worked through them in a period of about 18 months. Um, and I, I believe that that was a dedicated effort by our chief and assistant chief at the time, uh, just putting a full court blitz on the uh, on the um, issue or um, the issue of the backlog, and getting um, all of our judges um, available to dedicate their time to working through that backlog. Thank you, Tim. Timothy Mulrooney, please. So one, one of the less glamorous parts about being a judge is that we are responsible for case management. And uh, that means that however many cases we have, court administration gives us our fair share and we need to manage those cases to a conclusion so that they don't become a backlog. And, and that is a big part of a judge's job. Um, and I've been, I've been doing that for 16 years. I did eight years as a referee in family court and there's probably no court where case management is more, uh, needed and frankly more successfully accomplished than in the family courts in the in the states in the courts in the state of Minnesota um, but a judge needs to manage those cases we do that by being prepared when the case comes to court so it doesn't get delayed or continued we do that by early case management engaging with lawyers and the parties early to see if their cases can be resolved um, I do that by being accessible to the lawyers in my cases they know that if they need uh, to get the lawyers together to see if there's a get through a log jam in a case that they can reach me, that I will get them on my calendar and we'll get the log jam unstuck. Uh, and that is really a huge part of the work that a judge does. Thank you, Timothy. And Timothy, and we'll start with you with this next question. How do you balance public safety with rehabilitation in sentencing decisions? Uh, that's a great question, and that is that's at the heart of a lot of the decisions that a judge makes. We make the this, we make those balancing decisions between um, not just rehabilitation but civil liberties on the one hand and public safety on the other. When we make bail decisions, and we make those decisions when we make sentencing decisions, and we make quite honestly probably hundreds of those decisions every week if you're in the criminal division, um, and so you have to look at um, the relative risks and you have to look at the risk to public safety in the particular case, the conduct the person is alleged to have engaged in um, and their history. You also have to acknowledge that there's a, if it's a bail decision that there's a presumption of innocence. If it's a sentencing decision, we follow the law and the sentencing guidelines are very clear about uh, what dispositions are supposed to be and we'll barring substantial and compelling reasons to depart and I follow that law. Thank you. Tim Carey, please. Uh, thank you. I also uh, adhere to the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines. I have some familiarity of, uh, with them uh, from my time as a probation parole officer and my time as a lawyer, um, but um, they they take on a new significance when you're asked by the attorneys to depart, um, They and they come to you with uh, passionate pleas to give their client another chance. Uh, it is a, a difficult thing to, to follow the guidelines when it means someone's going to be incarcerated for uh, 10 to 12 to 15 years uh, and um, yet uh, those guidelines are there for a reason and um, it's our job to uphold them and depart only when there are those substantial and compelling reasons. Um, on the bail evaluations, uh, we do have some, um, inf or on the bail decisions, we do have some um, information about the person's history, their background, uh, and um, we use that information to balance uh, um, the arguments that are coming at us and determine whether this person is going to come back to court if they're released or whether they're likely to reoffend while if we're there be to be released to the community again. Thank you, Tim. And we'll start with you with this next question. Um, we've talked a little bit about how you stay informed, but let's dig a little bit deeper into um, how you maintain uh, professional development. So you mentioned, um, and you both have mentioned some com com cultural competency and the fact that you do a lot of reading and that you look at the appellate cases and legislation. So with all of that, where do you fit in professional development? 
Uh, well, we do have um, judicial conferences that we attend that are specifically geared towards, the curriculum for each of them is usually geared towards um, hot topics um, that are unfolding in all different kinds of areas of the law. Um, we have um, lunch and learn, locally at the second, we have what are called lunch and learns, um, where we try to share with one another um, specific areas of expertise that we have. Um, we have a new statute governing uh, people who are incompetent to proceed in criminal court and uh, we host staffings um, or attend staffings or uh, trainings on those types of um, changes in the law. Um, in terms of the cultural competence, um, we do hear from the community. Um, we have lots of work groups that um, involve our justice partners and um, we have specific uh, treatment providers in the community that help us understand who we're trying to serve in the community. Thank you very much. Tim, uh, Timothy Mahoney, Mahoney yeah. Hooney, please. Mulrooney, Mulrooney, <laughs> sorry. This one over here, right? Yeah, yeah, Okay. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I, uh, you know, so professional development and cultural uh, competency, I, I'm, I'm gonna um, incorporate by reference everything that he said, because I wanna hit on a couple of additional things. I would say professional development wise, so judges move, we move around. Uh, you know, my background was family court and, I, and criminal before that. When I became a judge, I worked in criminal. I kind of remembered what I did 16 years early in criminal, but I had a lot to learn. Um, or later, I moved into the juvenile division or particularly civil commitment division. There's an enormous amount of learning to be done when you move into a division, and you really have to dig in. You got to read the you got to read the law. You have to talk to partners about how the systems actually work. Um, you need to work with court administration to understand how everything works in the background in order to be effective. Um, and then, in, in terms of cultural competence, it's just really important that we remain engaged in educating ourselves about um, um, cultures and folks that come before us who are different than our own, and we do that. Thank you very much. And Timothy, we'll start with you with this next question. What do you consider your greatest legal accomplishment and why? Well, that question sounds like it's asking, you know, what was the greatest victory I had in front of a, a, a jury or some appellate court, and I don't know that I have one of those to cite. I will, so I'm gonna reach deep and say that the thing I am most proud of in the work I've done um, in my career, and it, um, I know it comes back to mental health, but it's mental health. Um, when I was a uh, new judge, I worked in criminal, then I rotated to juvenile, then I rotated to commitments. This gentleman was a lawyer in commitments at the time and taught me a lot about how civil commitment worked. Our court administration and commitments taught me a lot about how people move around with the Department of Human Services and our secure hospitals and our case managers and so forth. Um, and there are a tremendous amount of gaps in that system due, due to I, um, siloed systems, due to limited resources. And since 2021, I've chaired our work group, where it's tr which is trying to make that better. I think we have made that significantly better and we have a long way to go, but that is the thing of which I am most proud. Thank you. Tim Carey, please. Well, uh, we're gonna sound like broken records here, but I uh, do agree that um, probably my biggest accomplishment is understanding that uh, in the criminal system and, and in fact throughout the any of the judicial assignments, um, a lot of judges will tell you that uh, mental health issues um, are sort of the predicate for a person's uh, presentation in court. And so, um, and yet uh, we don't have a lot of great interaction between our court systems and the mental health systems. And so I've, um, I'm most proud of the fact that I've worked extremely hard to understand how the whole mental health continuum of care works, how the referral process works, what happens when, they've, when those issues fall apart, uh, where the gaps in care are, and then how can we um, sort of uh, reverse engineer our criminal um, interaction, or our court interaction with people that have those issues and need that care so that um, we are accomplishing as much as we can towards getting them better, which I believe results in a better community. Thank you very much. And Timothy, or did we, you already did that one? Sorry, no. Okay. 
Got distracted. Didn't, didn't, get my, didn't get my check mark down there. <laughs> all right, we've got one more question before closing remarks, and this is just kind of all encompassing. Is there any topic that, um, because our answers are a lot of times limited to one minute or so, is there any topic that you want to spend another minute talking about that you think that the public really needs to understand or should research so that they make a good decision when they vote? And um, Tim, Tim, we'll start with you. All right. Um, I think one thing for the public to understand about judges, uh, and I've got, I've spent a lot of time this summer um, in fall campaigning, going door to door, going to events, and a lot of people want me to become uh, uh, an activist in one way or another. They want to know my political affiliation. They want to know what I stand for. They want to know if I'm tough on crime or hard on crime. And I want people to understand that my job as a judge is to shift into neutral um, and to sit on the seat of what the law tells me to do, listen to the arguments with an open mind on, uh, to both sides and um, both concerns, uh, and make a, uh, issue an order that comports with the law. Um, I can't do that based on my belief that you're a Democrat and you're a Republican, and I can't do that based on my belief that if you're charged with a crime, you're probably guilty. Um, so I, I wish if nothing else comes of this election um, on, on the judicial race, that people hear that and understand that and embrace that reality. Thank you, Tim. Timothy Mulrooney, please. Um, I, I would echo all of that. And I guess what the additional thing, I, I, I'd like to expand on all of my answers, but I'm afraid I'm all in front of me to be able to build on what I had said. But, but I think what I would emphasize um, that I hope it maybe comes through as we discuss all these areas in the justice system is that this is a really complicated job. And um, we make decisions every day that, and we are, both bound to apply the law faithfully to those decisions. We need to make determinations about the facts, so we have to be able to weigh facts, listen to testimony, and make intelligent decisions about what to believe. Um, and an enormous amount, amount of the work that a judge does is making, um, uh, is balancing factors, like we've talked about, public safety versus civil liberty. And, um, and those are complicated decisions that have real significant impact on people's lives. Do you get out of jail or do you stay in jail? Do you keep your kids or do you lose your kids? Do you get um, um, required to stay in a hospital or not? And um, it takes significant experience to exercise good judgment around that, and it um, requires a deep understanding of the law. Thank you very, thank you very much. Now we will proceed to our closing statements. Unless there's any other questions, just we're good. Okay, um, and we will proceed in a, a reverse order from when we did our opening statement. So, Timothy Mulrooney, we'll start with you for your two-minute closing statement. I'm one of the really difficult things about the running for election like this is that. Uh, I don't particularly like to go around and talk about myself, uh, but that's what you have to do. And I will, uh, so I'm gonna do that and I will say, I hope you'll consider, I hope the public will consider reelecting me for another term as a Ramsey County judge. And I um, submit that um, I'm qualified to do that. I'm a, I think I excel at the work I do and, um, and I believe I have a track record that demonstrates that. In my race in particular, that is a central question is whether or not experience is what is, a, is an essential element to being a good and a qualified judge. Not the only element, but a significant and important and essential one. And I have a lot of experience. I have been a lawyer for 30 years. I have practiced criminal law on both sides. I have practiced civil litigation and family law. Both as a lawyer, I have presided over many, 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 probably thousands of family cases in, in Hennepin County Family Court. I have been a judge for eight years and I've worked in all the divisions. I've done criminal work and civil work and juvenile work um, and significantly around civil commitment and mental health. Um, and I am, I, I do really do dig in to try to find ways that we can do better. We're a system and our system is far from perfect. And judges are in a really unique position to identify the areas where we can improve and to affect improvement. 
whether it's, um, it's, I've done a lot of work around mental health, I have chaired committees around child protection, around pretrial justice, um, around, around multiple times around domestic abuse, and in all of those areas, we do a very good job, but we can do better, um, and a judge should be involved in that in addition to deciding their particular cases. I think I have the experience um, to do that, I have the track record. You can look me up and see that. Um, if you if you look at my endorsements, it's not too fun to uh, highlight my endorsements, but I highlight those because I think it's helpful for voters to know what other people who care about the justice system think about the work I do. Um, and so I would encourage people to flip over the ballot. Please do flip over the ballot and vote in the judicial races and I hope you'll vote for me. Thank you, Timothy. And Tim Carey, please. Uh, in closing, I would emphasize that the themes of my career and my service to the public for the last 30 years has been um, in most recently around uh, learning and applying the law to um, facts and controversies that come before me. And um, the other um, component is um, risks and needs analysis. So um, as a probation officer, it was a constant analysis of a person's risk to reoffend in a sexually harmful manner. Uh, as, um, as a judge um, in veterans treatment court and mental health court and competency court, uh, we do an initial assessment of a person's needs for treatment and care and um, what their risk is um, to themselves or to other people. We consistently come back to those issues of what their um, the person's risks and needs are on a regular basis. Um, and we do that um, by engaging the community providers and engaging any other people that have contact with the person in the community who become part of our process. I um, know the providers in this community. I know this community. Um, I've, like I said, I've lived here the better part of 30 years. Um, I've been extremely engaged uh, in improve, not just learning the law to apply it in my work um, and advocating for people when I was a lawyer and a PO, uh, but also um, in making sure that we make every effort that we can to improve the systems and improve the processes that are here to serve the public um, that I was appointed to serve. Uh, I would um, suggest that I have strong relationships with not just the justice partners, but um, the other people in our system that have the authority and the power to make certain changes happen. And that's because I invested in those relationships and I took the time to join extra group work groups and inform those work groups of what I see every day in court. Um, I see a community that has a lot of strengths based on its diversity, and I see a community that has um, some, some work to do and that needs some help from the court. I am um, the better candidate to do that based on my experience and my training. Thank you very much. This concludes the candidate forum for the second judicial district, court three and court 29. We close with several thank yous. First, on behalf of the League of Women Voters, please join me in thanking the candidates for being part of the democratic process by running for office and for being willing to serve our community. Thank you also to the League of Women Voters volunteers, our audience here, and those viewing this event virtually for your participation in this candidate forum. Finally, thank you to SPNN for recording tonight's forum. For additional election information, we encourage you to visit vote411.org, the League of Women Voters award-winning one-stop shop where voters can register to vote, find their polling place, and learn how candidates stand on issues. Please remember to vote on or before November 5th. On the November ballot, Minnesota voters will be asked to reauthorize or end a constitutional amendment allocating 40% of the state lottery proceeds to the Environment and National Resources, Natural Resources Trust Fund. Over 50% of the voters must vote yes to approve this constitutional protection of the system. Leaving the question blank counts as a no vote. Please be sure to look for this amendment and vote. Early voting is already underway. Your vote is your voice. The League of Women Voters welcomes new members, both men and women. Please find more information at LWVS. Thank you and good night.